without his good friend Mallow Kelly, Andy Dunn's in the studio. I miss him. I do miss him dearly. I just thought we started off last week with a nice anecdote about Mal having a hot dog before a match and having to wipe mustard off his yeah. corner of his mouth in front of the coach, and now it's just you and me. <laughs> <laughs> just back to the boring... Well, it certainly wasn't boring for the last 20 minutes in here. No, I mean, well, the papers. The, yes. Yeah, well, it's always... Well, the studio is normally red, but it's got a tint of, <laughs> tint of blue. No, 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 it was, um, it was absolutely fine. So... We might talk Leinster because they're kicking off very shortly and if we don't do that then everything will be dated very quickly. They've named a slightly different team to Manny on the wing but um, all in all everybody's expecting Leinster to go to Toulouse who have not won a Heineken mm. Cup since 2010 or a top 14 since 2012 and finished third in the top 14 and missed the Champions Cup last year and are just getting back to what they aspire to be. That is in broad terms where they are. Everybody's expecting Leinster to go to France and to win this game. Are we getting ahead of ourselves in any way here? Are we underestimating the French challenge? I think a little bit because um, the nature of, of Toulouse rugby is um, it's kind of an in-house organisation. They've they they Liverpool did the famous kind of boot room mm-hmm. strategy back in the eighties and, and Toulouse very much mirror that. Um so much so that they brought in um I can't do I know the Hugo Mola as their head coach. Reggie Son. Reggie Son, yeah. Who was who, a former player. Yeah, yeah, who who has a very interesting backstory of being down in Bandit. West Cork yeah. in Bandon and uh coaching kids, playing, you know, coaching local club rugby and asked, would he, would he come back to his former club? Can we regenerate and uh, and make this club great again? He said if any other club in the world had have asked him, he had no interest, zero interest in going into professional sport. But his home club came calling and he said, I can't say no. And He's a philosophical type, as yeah. that quote suggests and so he was the forwards coach with Bordeaux mm. a former Toulouse player won a Heineken Cup under Guy Noves as a player and then he was working as a forwards coach mm. with Bordeaux and just had a bit of burnout and got sick of it all and yeah. sick of seeing the same people every day and doing the same thing every day so he hightailed it to Bandon yeah. and worked with the school there and the local rugby club, club there for two years and had great quotes like I'm a West Cork man now I yeah. love the Guinness I love the people yeah. I love meeting new people every day and new experiences mm. it's a lovely life and yeah. he didn't really want to go but obviously Toulouse came calling so he did so he's an interesting fella and actually yeah. um, Keith Wood was saying during the week he did a really good job in Bandon yeah. he's left in place really good structures and setups and they you know, really turn things around down there so yeah it's an interesting coaching ticket well I think professional sport overall and rugby within that need people like him you know people who have a sense of joy a sense of fun they can they can be emotional as well as strategic and it makes for a more interesting viewing more interesting game today and yeah. um, what I would be thinking is that Leinster are going to go out and win the game. I do think they're going to win. Um, which, like you said, are we getting ahead of ourselves? It, I think it goes to show, after the last 10 years, how far Leinster have sure. gone. I mean, it's expectant now that they go to Toulouse and win, yeah. which is a sea change from my time. And don't get me wrong, I was very much a part of that all week in my um, closing remarks to say Keith and Maddie. I was saying, and I presume a Leinster win on Sunday, and it's only just as we're here at kickoff and you look at the teams and you realise they're in yeah. France, they're in, you know, Stade yeah. Ernest, Ernest Vallon, yeah. that you think, oh, actually, this is, this is, you know, this is the atmosphere they have to deal with and all the other bits and pieces. Now, I still sort of think they're going to win. <laughs> yeah. No, I, 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 when you look through the, the, um, the personnel, the, the guys on the team are so vastly experienced in terms of international football and also I think the way they train is is really interesting it's one of these setups where um, you know they the the poor 20 minutes I heard uh, Jordan Larmer talk about this this poor 20 minute period in training he wasn't even talking about a match they were poor 20 minutes in training and Lancaster and Cullen hauled them in and they had a big discussion about it and they're like, you know, what's going on? Recently? Yeah. It was a 20 minutes in training. It wasn't even the full training session. It was a 20 minute period in their training session that dropped off the radar a bit and uh, they weren't having it. So You I, suspect I, I think that Cullen and Lancaster are paranoid at any slippage in standards? Because yeah. if it was ever going to happen, yeah. 
then, yeah. particularly after the Wasps game and everything and all the plaudits, it could yeah. happen around now. Yeah, but they, they really, I, I, I've said it a couple of times and maybe hesitant to keep saying it, but they're very like the All Blacks. I really, I really think it. They've got this um, absolute push to, to do the, the basics extremely well. Mm. And, and that's at every facet of their game. That's at the set piece, that's at the breakdown, that's at passing, that's in defence, it's in support lines. Um, and when you hear a young kid like Jordan Lyme we're talking about, you know, we dropped off for 20 minutes in training yeah, and we got hauled over the coals for it. Um, it's really great to hear, I think. It's a very familiar looking Leinster team in terms of personnel, the names jump out at you. So Larmer at full back, Rob Carney is in fit this weekend. Joe Tamani is in, we'll talk about him in a moment, he's on the right wing. Then it's very familiar, Ringrose and Henshaw in the centres. James Lowe, who we've talked about ad nauseum for all the right reasons in the last couple of weeks, is on the left wing. It's Sexton at 10 and McGrath at 9. The front row is Keane Healy, Sean Cronin and Tyke Furlong. Devin Toner and James Ryan are in the second row. And then it's Reese Ruddock, who has gone from not being involved last week to suddenly yeah. a starting berth in both games. Reese Ruddock at 6. Josh van der Fleer is at 7. And Jack Conan is at 8. And then the bench has everybody from Sean O'Brien to Ross Byrne to Nick McCarthy, who's Munster bound to James Tracy, Jack Ferdy. McGrath. Is Rory Lachlan is there, actually. Fer Fergie <coughs> McFadden is not there. Ross Byrne is there. Scott Fardy is there. So McFadden hasn't made the bench. Oh, sorry, did you say Fardy? Fardy, yes, yeah. Yes, Fardy um, is there. Sorry, I thought you said Fergie. I no, presume no. that's what you might have called Fergus McFadden. Oh, yeah, I'm yeah. relieved that you don't, actually. No, no, yeah. 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 No, no, Fardy is there. I would call him Fergus on there, yeah. Yeah. So that's where they are. That's that team. Did you see any of Bath Toulouse last week? Did you see Toulouse in action? Uh, I did, yeah. Um, so what are Toulouse about then for you? I think they're trying to, they, they have a philosophy, they have a, they have a very kind of deep-rooted core philosophy of trying to pass out of the tackle, mm. which a lot of teams don't, um, a lot of teams aspire to or, or speak about, but don't actually do in practice. Um, and particularly with these, again, that boot room philosophy of, you know, keeping consistency, they jam Baptiste Alassal for a while, obviously on the, on the tail end of Noves, mm. where... They, they really, really promote, in tr I think, in training and in in, in practice and play uh, in live competition to pass out of the tackle, maybe t to their detriment, in fact. If they're not doing it well, mm. they'll turn over the ball quickly. But um, I don't expect they're going to go away from that in any way in terms of their philosophy. It's, it's a like I said, it's a deep-rooted thing that's been going on for years and years. Mm. And I think it's what, indeed, has brought them four European Cups. Mm. Um what they don't have is the same quality of player yeah. executing that yeah. that they had in the last. You know, I, I saw an article during the week um, in their last Heineken Cup win, and Cedric Haymans and Alassal were sitting on the bench. You know, that kind of quality um, that day's they gone. Don't have yeah. No. Tamane on the right wing for Leinster. Have you seen much of him early on? Early impressions? Yeah, <clears throat> I saw him last year quite a bit um, when he was playing in France. Yeah. He's he's um he's just quite a physical guy. I'm not sure of all the guys Leinster have brought in over the years. A lot of them have had a bit of X factor. A lot of them, have, Tamani's a bit more vanilla in that he's just you know he's a strong ball carrier. He's yeah. physical. I'm not sure if he's got a bit of X factor in his game at all. But he won't he won't let you down. Mm. But um, I don't think there's when you look at the likes of. You know, Nathan Hines coming in, Brad Thorne, Felipe Contepomi, these guys, even James Lowe now is up, yeah. is up in that territory. Um, I don't think Tamani's going to feature in, in uh, along that uh, register with, with the, the big names, but, um, you know, just a good, solid pro. Yeah. Stuart Lancaster's done various interviews in the Sunday papers today, <coughs> talks very interestingly about a number of things, family life and yeah. the demands there, and his wife is suddenly at home now, the kids have fled the nest, and his mother as well is now unfortunately a widow in recent times, so he's dealing with all of that. On the rugby side of things, he was making some interesting points. He was saying that they've obviously mined all the stats that you could imagine, and one of the interesting things they found is that consistency of selection or cohesion in a team is 
absolutely fundamental. You know, we're all discovering what statistics are yeah. pliable and work. And, you know, we're, we're at that frontier now where we're trying to figure out we've got all this information, what mm. actually is true. And they're, they're really coming, on to the, coming upon the, the fact that cohesion, team cohesion is very important. And so he said, like, if you look at our team, it's going to be around for the next X number of years. And, mm. and it strikes me as well, they, I know they change the team a lot, but they often pick similar partnerships. Yes. Is the striking thing. So there is a real method to how, when Leo Cullen is charting each month in advance, you will see with Leinster the same partnerships, not necessarily the same teams, but in the pockets around the field, there's actually a real consistency there. It's one of the fantastic things they've done, really mm-hmm. clever thing too. Do yeah. You, uh, I do you have that suspicion as a player? Like the cohesion is actually huge, huge, huge here. I, uh, it's, it's far more than a suspicion. I think it's a fact. I think wh- if you top it, I mean, there's a lot to be said for squad rotation in terms of keeping guys fresh. Yeah. And that's fine. Yeah. And we all get that now. And I think the... The players within squads from week to week will understand and accept that, okay, this week's not my week for X, Y and Z reasons. Mm. But if you chop and change the fundamental partnerships in your team regularly, you will get no cohesion. And the one area um, that is, I suppose, the most dynamic area in the Leinster rugby setup, I think, at the moment is the back row. That's the one that that seems to change. But Mm. if you look at what's selected today compared to last week, um, you've still got McGrath, Sexton, you've still got the centre partnership. The back three changes a bit more regularly, but the core and spine of that group isn't changing mm. all that much. And there, you know, you see uh, Healy and Furlong, you see Ryan and Toner in the second row, and you've got your uh, your shot callers in, in Johnny and Luke there. So, yeah, I, I, I don't think, I, th- I think Lancaster and Cullen are very, very sharp and Mm. smart Mm. in general Mm. and I think they're absolutely on the money in terms of don't break down your fundamentals Mm. but chop and change with certain guys week Mm. to week you know the data I think they're probably using the data from a physical point of view and they're saying okay you know the sports science guys are saying this guy's back is is kicking off a bit in training during the week he was doing his gym and squats and all the rest and maybe he's off on that I think that's a fair call but they, they're not chopping and changing on mm. their strategists. Well it's backed up by statistics, they're yeah. not just yeah. stumbling upon that fact. Nick McCarthy is obviously making his way mm. down to Talman Park mm. next season and Leo Cullen yesterday, did you see the quotes? No. I think it's starting to irritate Leo Cullen. Yeah. So it was front page news in, in certain papers and he just it was an aside comment, he didn't go on a rant or anything like that, I don't want mm. to misrepresent him but he, he did say now wouldn't be like him no exactly not very ranty yeah. exactly which, which in a way heightens the comments because he said sure. we are aware of some clubs near here <laughs> clubs close by who are ringing up our younger players and selling them stories about where they could go and where they could yeah. be with them um, I, so yeah. I think maybe the McCarthy one has maybe f- he's, I think he's, he's like right, where does this end yeah. if, I, if I keep letting this go and not saying anything where does this end it's one yeah. of the biggest threats to Leinster in the short term, medium term. Yeah, it is, and I think um, I think he's Leo's very measured in general, mm. and uh, like you said, t- to go on record about this, you know, the clubs nearby. And now I hadn't heard it until you, literally you yeah. just said it to me. Selling there. them stories. Yeah, but that's um, I think that's a reality. I, mm. There's there's a very fair argument to say, okay, what are the other academies doing? compared to the Leinster Academy and it's a bit like the Dubs GAA you know it's a self-fulfilling prophecy or did they actually go and do it themselves did they construct this and they did the Dubs went and constructed this 10-15 years ago when they were in the doldrums they needed to make a change and they made changes at grassroots level they they put money into that area and they said let's get kids and develop them and develop them and develop them and at some point it will come to fruition and they, they did the exact same in hurling. Now Leinster went from a period I'm trying to give an example, I played I played a Leinster Munster game I always remember this because it was the only non-capped player on the field, there was 29 internationals on the field and me <laughs> and there was about 1500 people at the match in Donnybrook and that was 1999. Wow. Would he play in that game? Uh, in 2009, 10 years later, 84,000 people were in Crow Park for the Heineken Cup quarterfinal. That doesn't happen by accident. There's people involved in, in marketing and strategy and all the rest. 
who who grow the game within a province, and that was what led Peter Breen was in charge of their PR. They had, a, they had a huge drive in terms of opening the game up to the greater Dublin mm-hmm. population. And they did put money into it and they did fund it and their academies have brought through some amazing players and you look at Larmer and this. And what's happening is, I don't think to, to the same extent Munster, Ulster or Connacht, they haven't been as proactive, they haven't been as, as strategic and, and driven and focused and as a result, they're picking off guys like Nick McCarthy. Um, I think Carby's a slightly different example. He's probably a higher echelon, and he's Joe Schmidt was probably involved in that. And I get it, and I think it was the right call. And mm. you know, increasingly, it feels, but like you the know, right the, call, yeah. yeah. And uh, but, but the likes of McCarthy, I suppose they're looking at. Um, he, he's a really valuable player in in the Leinster season. Yes, he's not the most valuable guy on their team. But he's a really valuable player when they say, OK, we, we, can, we can turn to Nick when we need him. Now, Nick may have far greater uh, ambitions than that, and that's fine too. But uh, when Leo talks about the, the other club saying, you know, uh, talking to our young guys saying the grass is greener over on, uh, you know, a couple of hundred miles away, I get his frustration because if you think he's been a part of this growth of Leinster rugby over 10 to 12 years mm. and they deserve to, to reap the rewards of that. They don't necessarily deserve to bring a guy through, have a good squad player and he keeps getting picked off and picked off and picked off. I get mm. that frustration. Yeah, I suppose the difficult question or the, the line that's hard to draw is you ask, well, when is enough enough? Mm. And I don't certainly feel like well the Nick McCarthy mm. going uh, situation. Well, that's enough for all it's of us. Like that, you know, it, it's a bit I'm like sure the straw the that breaks the camel. Yeah, I don't know where though. that's going to be. Yeah, it's certainly fine at the moment. Well, like, I don't, got, I don't think they've got a young guy called Hugh O'Sullivan who right. is fun, who's a superb rugby player. What position he, is he? Well, he's scrum half. So um, he played fullback in schools rugby for Belvedere College and won a couple of senior cups. And uh, he's one of the first guys in recent history who's gone f- straight from school into the full academy in our in our halcyon days it was you go straight from school into the I was contracted with Gordon Darcy yeah. out of school that was it there was no such thing as an academy yeah. now what they do is they contract you out of school into the sub academy or the sub sub academy or you know it's very staged and progressive gradually and uh, but but uh, O'Sullivan has leapfrogged all that gone straight into the academy okay. with a view to getting a full contract uh, so if he goes then Andy Dunn will say enough is enough I think uh, yeah. Leo Cullen might yeah, yeah for sure they've kicked off over in France to lose with an early penalty Thomas Ramos kicking over for the French side three points to nil four minutes gone See, uh, Intermac is starting. Yes, yeah, son of the great Intermac. Son of the great, yeah. Yeah, yeah and uh, a very prodigious um, World Cup, under-20s World Cup yeah. in, uh, in the last season as well. So interesting to watch his development. Yeah, we'll keep an eye out. He came on last week as well at the Rec. So four minutes gone there. Leinster three points to nil down, but very early stages. Blue skies, beautiful French weather over there. Munster yesterday, 36 points to 22. Bonus point in the bag. They topped the pool. And... Yet nobody was that enthralled, not least the Munster players themselves. They were kind of scratching mm. their heads a little bit. Peter Amani, in, in his interview afterwards, said, well, we didn't plan to play like that. If you didn't see the game, kind of first 20 minutes, they really weren't in it at all. And then the referee involved himself. Tom Savage got a yellow card and then ultimately Cipriani got sent off. Mm. And then Munster got their tries. That was sort of the broad story of the game. What did you make of it? Um, yeah, I think your, your summation is, is pretty accurate there. I, it was a huge change a huge moment in the game where um, Cipriani was was sent off. Um, I'm going to be definitive on it. I think it was, ultimately, I think it was the right decision. I think, you know, Rudy Giuliani cleaned up New York, zero tolerance. Hmm. That's what he did. I, I, you know, let's not have a grey area. And in fairness, Cipriani just took it like a pro. He yeah. just jogged off the field. He nodded at the guy who he hit. Um, it wasn't a cheap shot. There was no malice. There was no intent. And he got red carded and it changed the game. And uh, ultimately, though, I think brave decisions like that, some people say foolhardy, some pe- people say the ref didn't use any kind of common sense. But ultimately, it's going to clean up the game. Well, let's think. follow that point through then, OK? I'm with you so far. So say in a year's time, 
we've had multiple sendings off mm. for shoulders touching heads. And we saw Jerome yeah. Kaino get five weeks mm. last week yeah. for the tackle against uh, Jamie Roberts. Oh, Toulouse could be in here on the left-hand side. Leinster are scrambling back. Toulouse have started well. God, I wonder if we all just taken all this for granted in France. Leinster got very lucky there. There was just a ball which should have been caught and wasn't. But they'll go back. They had advantage to lose. So they'll kick a penalty which will go over for a six points to nil lead against Leinster. Six minutes gone. So say we follow it through and there have been multiple sendings off and everybody in the sport is hyper aware shoulder can not go near head. Yeah. Parallel universe, Gloucester playing Munster. Cyprian is in exactly the same situation. It's about to happen. What will he do? Will he be able to he'll get out of the way? Yeah, he'll drop his height. It's a choice. Okay, so he could have reacted <clears throat> better. Yeah, he could. you could. You always have a choice You, in these situations. You can choose to sink your knees and your hips a bit more. Mm. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm being definitive about okay. it. I'm, I'm not going to go with this grey kind of chit-chat about it. I think they're doing the right thing. I think it's for the benefit of the game, it's for the safety of the game, it's for the progression of the game, it's for, you know, Sunday morning parents watching their seven-year-old running around mm. and... Yeah, and when you look at what happened in the in the UFC and and um, in the McGregor fight, and your man hopping over the ring, and I saw a really interesting ar- article during the week about the the parents of MMA kids and the coaches of MMA kids talking about how the UFC is is completely sullying the the good name of MMA, and they're trying and desperately trying to fight for, um, I suppose. A, a cleanliness to what is a barbaric sport. You look at rugby and how at times physically barbaric this game is. You just simply get zero tolerance around shoulder to head challenges. Mm. You're cleaning up a lot of those grey areas mm. and and like I said, I, I was very I was very very much admired Danny Cipriani's response it was fantastic. to what happened. Yeah, he must have been I, think so that, I think that guy has had a really, you know, interesting, colourful career. I think he's he's probably very open about it. He's had his demons, he's had his moments, he's gone from all kinds of stories, been hit by a bus over in Melbourne when he was out drinking to getting dropped off international squads and all the rest. Um, and I just admire him, I have to say. He's, he's got a lot of resilience. He's still playing at a very, very high level. He's very unlucky not to be in that English squad, but I suppose Eddie Jones doesn't want to bring... Cipriani in with the associated baggage perhaps because he's certainly not picking on form yeah. as he says he is because if he was picking on form that guy would be in the squad By your logic on the directives Billy Twelvetrees should have been sent off as well then. Yes So I mean there could be some pain in the short term here we could have yeah. 15 on 13 or 15 on 12 yeah. if yeah, but I, like, when, there, when there's money involved and there is in professional sport and I, I feel the same way about professional football when I watch it Um yeah, just get get hard on it, get get aggressive, and if it ends up twelve on fourteen in a match, it will stop very 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 quickly. Yeah, because you'll find training methods will change, coaches' directives will change, and they just understand the message, which is wholehearted, clear black and white message. You cannot do it. And the attraction for the high tackle is to stop offloads. Yes. And the attraction for lower tackles uh, is safety and making the game better because it promotes offloads. Mm. And if you get a game where guys can pass out of the tackle more safely, you're going to get a better game. And you, you had uh, Stephen Jones, like an old crank, ranting last week, you know, bring back scrummages and what's wrong with modern rugby, there's too many tries. It was a bizarre article in a way. I, I, I reread it and read it again and I thought, very well written and very... Interesting and, and entertaining, yeah. but garbage. His point is garbage okay. because it's. Um, I watched. I went back and watched the 1982 Triple Crown game on YouTube with Ollie Campbell, where you know it was one of these glory days for Irish rugby. I mean, the ball was in play for about 15 minutes. In 18, it was just scrum, line out, scrum, kick, scrum, knock on, scrum, reset. Right. It's strange to watch that yeah. 30 years, but later and um, you don't have to waste your days like that I mean, give me a call I'll meet you for a coffee <laughs> don't, yeah, don't hide in isolation lonely. get out of the house it's good um, with your out half on uh, out, out half hat on it's quite the sentence yeah. I gave myself Joey Carberry yeah I'm loving what's going on there um, I mentioned Ollie briefly there Ollie was always a guy who 
Ollie's, Ollie's big thing about playing 10 was get three 80-minute periods in a row without getting taken off, without getting injured. Then you'll start to find some form. And Joey never really had that in Leinster as a 10. Mm. Well, I think Dave McIntyre was making the point yesterday mm. that with his appearance yesterday, he's doubled his number of European appearances at yeah. the end of his career. Yeah. So, really, um, yeah, I think I, I coached against Joey Carberry in the All Ireland League as a club coach with Albelvo against Clontarf. And he was a guy. Two years ago, three years ago? Two, about two, three years ago, yeah. Was there much talk about him? Yeah, there was huge talk, and you don't see a lot of guys who come out of the system from clubs into professional rugby don't, you know, shoot the lights out in in the way he did. Yeah, and I always compare him to the way O'Driscoll was at a cl- at club level. O'Driscoll playing in UCD was shooting the lights out. Everyone was talking about him, and he went from UCD straight into the Irish team, and then back down to Leinster after an Australian tour. Yeah, that's how his career started but what he was doing at club level he then brought into international level and back down to provincial and kept it going when I watched Carby one night it was a floodlit game in Old Bev there on a Friday evening and he he was walking on water relative to the other club players on the field and I remember chatting to Andy Wood who is he's the games master in, in Belvedere College and he's the head coach of Clontarf and I said What's going? On? Who is this guy, yeah. and what's going on with him? Yeah. And he said, "Yeah, no, he's on everybody's radar, and I think he's going to come through. Come through it." And uh, and Andy kind of, I suppose, and he's a nonchalant type of character. He's a Kiwi. He just said, "Yeah, he, I won't have him much longer." And okay. He um, getting those those regular eighty minute periods with Monster is le- affording him time on the field to. I suppose to be a different type of strategist than we were accustomed to when you look at Johnny Sexton, mm. when you look at, you know, cold clinical strategists who drive teams to, to success mm. in the way Johnny does, he's quite different. Mm. But it doesn't mean you can't be a strategist in a, in, a, in a different way or in a slightly less dogmatic way or he's very creative. I mean... If you look at what happened there, there was that, that period around the um, Sammy Arnold strike. He 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 got caught in contact, flicked a reverse pass around his back, kept the ball alive. To I think he passed it to, to the winger, and the and the ball was kept alive. He then came into the next phase of play where he received a ball, you know, one of these out the back door passes from from one of the forwards who was in the front line and gave it back to Carby. And what he did was he, he had time on the ball for a split second longer than you would expect. And he hesitated and he showed a bit of footwork. He drew a defender and he passed to Arnold. Mm-hmm. And Arnold suddenly had the ball in his hand with one defender in front of him, but probably 10 yards space either side of that defender, mm-hmm. which if people say great, great evasion and great speed and strength from Arnold to score, which it was. Mm. But Arnold wouldn't have got that opportunity if it wasn't for Carberry delaying the pass, mm. the footwork, the holding people. So in, in two phases of play, Munster scored a try. They never would have scored last year. Yeah. And you can say, is that creativity or strategy? Is it Carby, you know, pinpointing that pre-game? He isn't. Mm. But what he's doing is creating stuff for them that has not been there in mm. the last couple of years. And it's a different way for Munster to play rugby. Because they'll have to move with them a little bit, won't they? Yeah, I think they need to give them time. I think they need to say it's okay sometimes if you don't drill the corners with a one bend spiral into touch. It's okay because there's no point saying otherwise. That is not his strength either. Yeah, like his kicking will. Why? Why? You know? Why ought it to be his strength? If you if you've a guy who can drill the corners and can't do what Joey did in those two phases. Do you, do you harass the guy who keeps pinning the corners and say, you know, why don't you do flick pass at yeah. the back, delay, delay time on the ball and set up a try for something? He's, he's created seven points. He's contributed to with his kicking, which was yeah. excellent. Yeah. His place kicking was excellent. So, you know, can we, can we allow a guy to drive a game in a different way to Johnny? I think we ought to. And I think if you look at uh, Jack Carty, in down in Connacht, very very similar to Joey Carberry. Mm. So we have a bit of a change going on in terms of what's your classic 
out half classic Irish head half yeah strategy. or your classic yeah, Irish head half yeah, rather because yeah. you look at the Kiwis um, between Barrett Mackenzie yeah Moonga, you know even the guy uh, what's his name he's gone to Wasps um, he had a shocker S- last S- week S- S- Lange, Lange, yeah. yeah same villain they're all they're all Kiwi players in recent times who are very very different to your true. traditional ten. Yeah, Xavi and Iniesta are midfield generals in the different yes. places. Like yeah, him. yeah. Not to be the bearer of bad news, but uh, Toulouse have started very very well. Fifteen minutes gone, they are eleven points to nil up on Leinster. Maxime Medar, fresh from smashing the ball out of Freddie Burns's hand last week, has gone over on the left hand touchline just inside it. Tamane uh, tried to get to him, he could inside him. Cronin got there a bit late and. It's suddenly uh, Toulouse 11 points, Leinster nil. So the uh, conversion was uh, missed, but Thomas Ramos has kicked two penalties. 11 nil's not nothing away from home, 16 minutes gone. Certainly not, no. Um, worrying, worrying kind of opening quarter for Leinster. Um, See, Toulouse, yeah, like, it's funny. They're on an upward curve. Europe matters yeah. to them. They get a losing bonus point in... Or Sorry, they win. Sorry, of course, they win in Bath. Mm. So suddenly that focuses the mind and they're up for it and they've had 68% possession here. Yeah. Uh, so this is going to be tricky. This is, not, this is not a Toulouse side low on confidence or on form or even just you know, on, on, on their, kind of gen- their mood is good based on last week, you would think. Yeah, their form and, and keeping one eye on it here. Um, they're, they're playing some pretty strong rugby. Right. And um, yeah, this is going to be a serious comeback if if they can actually get it. If Leinster can come can screech this one back, seventy minutes gone, eleven nil down. I yeah, I could see them. Yeah, probably not getting a result here. At yeah, the yeah. So um, before you go, Ulster then went to Racing and were well beaten in the end. Shipped forty four points. Yeah, it can happen very easily. The Simon Zebo thing. Do you give him a free pass and we all move on very quickly, or were you kind of thinking this is you really shouldn't behave like this? Oh, with the. Uh, the quote unquote taunting of Yeah. Uh, well he he apologized after. Yeah, that was I, my, I, my I, I think, too, yeah. Yeah, it's a bit like um the Chelsea assistant coach running past yeah. Mourinho. Mourinho gets a bad press at the best of times and I you know, why wouldn't he react any differently with your man doing what he did? So yeah. but sorry, Maurizio sorry, I think Frog marched the guy into his office with Mourinho, made him apologise and said, Look, it's over. Yeah. Um yeah, the game has emotion in it. I don't think we should take it away. And Zebo, okay, yeah, he reacted but he he apologised and it, it seemed very mm. legit. Did, it yeah. seemed very, very honest and yeah, I I think fine, let's move on. I'm with you there. Did you see much of that game? Uh, just in patches. Um, I, th- I think um, I'm very interested in how Ulster are trying to progress. I think McFarland spoke about, he said there were glimmers of what we want to do. Uh, I think they went 10, 12 nil up. Yes. Um, but he also, he said, we got a lesson in accuracy. And uh, when Connacht won the Pro 14 under Pat Lamb at Christmas in that season, they had the most unforced errors Christmas, in the league. Yeah. Yeah, it was great and start, it's, yeah. it's a really interesting stat because they were persistent and and strong in their you know, they showed a lot of resolve and they showed a lot of you know just just general mental strength to push on through when you get criticized for trying to play a certain way. And like Farland is I think right in that maelstrom at the moment. He's like, Can we keep doing it mm. and can we get the fans behind us. I think the, the big plus for Dan is he's coming on the back of one of the most horrific years you could possibly imagine in a professional sporting yeah. season for a club. And it's uh, not, not hard to generate some comparable exactly, feel-good on the exactly. back of that. Exactly. I think yeah. they're going to get some feel-good and I think he's going to get some time. I think he should be afforded the time. So, um, but, but notwithstanding all Ulster's um, push for... for Better rugby. I think. I think Rossing are real, real strong and contenders, yeah. contenders and threat for for the Heineken Cup. When you look at their just their backline alone, their rebrain at nine, um, you've got the likes of Zebo on the wing, Finn Russell. Um, they, they, there's a lot going on. Teddy Thomas. They're 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 a real strong team and yeah. they're very very creative. So. Leinster have uh, shipped another three points, a penalty for Toulouse. It's fourteen nil, and Josh van der Fleer has had to go off injured. 
So Sean O'Brien is on, and uh, this is getting trickier by the second for Leinster. They're making one of their first forays into the Toulouse half as we speak, but 14-0 down, 20 minutes gone. Uh, I should remind you as well that obviously November internationals are around the corner, and we'll be looking ahead to them, including that All Blacks game in association with the Heineken Rugby Club, which is going to be our Off the Ball Roadshow live from the Olympia Theatre on Tuesday, November 13th, if you're knocking around the Olympia Theatre Dublin. We have an all-star lineup and an All Blacks legend who we'll be revealing over the next few days. So get on to offtheball.com <laughs> over the next few days. <laughs> offtheball.com forward slash events now. Uh, the Olympia is a great venue, actually, for these kind of things. Oh, tickets always go really quickly, so... Register for your tickets at offtheball.com forward slash events now. Uh, it's the latest Off The Ball Roadshow in association with Heineken Rugby Club. And remember, this is an over-18s oh. event only. Visit drinkaware.ie.